Okay, I've given a one minute grace period to any stragglers. Um, we still might get a few people come, but I know a lot of people register for these um wanting the recording. So I will send that out along with the slides um and any other pertinent links once the recording is ready. Um so if you're not able to stay the whole time, you'd still get the rest of it. Or if anybody comes in late, um they can see. But um I, so again, it is being recorded. You're welcome to go on camera or microphone if you'd like at any point, um, but that will also be recorded. So I will go through this sort of presentation portion um, that usually doesn't take that long. So then the end, I will leave time for questions and then I can, I'll stop the recording in case you have questions you don't necessarily want to be recorded and sent out. So um. That makes sense to me if you don't want that. Um, so welcome to Understanding the Cost of Open Access Publishing. My name is Miranda Fair. I am the Publishing and Open Scholarship Librarian here at Towson University. My email is up there, but I'll put it in the chat later. Also. So um, what I'm going to do basically is talk about um, the cost of open publishing, like from the researcher standpoint, not necessarily like what the costs are to the industry. Um, or, um, but th that is also a thing. So I'll go sort of over brief overview of what all these things mean, um, kind of the history of open access. So we can talk about like the why and how it's not an exhaustive history, don't worry. Um, and then talking a bit about like some strategies you can avoid having to pay fees or if there's any loopholes or um, like specific agreements we have with publishers that will allow you to not have to pay fees to publish. Um, so I'm going to be talking a lot about APCs. What that stands for is article processing charges. Basically, they're fees that publishers um, will charge an author um, or often an institution on their behalf to make their article fully open to all who want to read it. I'm on the publisher's platform. There's also BPCs, which are book processing charges, which are for open access um, monographs. Um, you see that less often just because more articles get published. So that's kind of what people will talk about more. Um, they do vary considerably between publishers. It's an average. It's between a thousand or three thousand um, U.S. dollars, which um, it's a pretty large sum. Um, but they also could be as small as nothing. They might also be eleven thousand dollars. That link is to a um, article that was talking about a Springer Nature Journal that was trying to charge 9,500 euros, which roughly equates to $11,000 for a single article to make it open access, um, which is ridiculous. And I, I like to bring it up a lot because it is ridiculous. Um, and that's just sort of how the academic publishing industry is. So just like a brief overview of why it's set up the way it is. This sort of originated from scholarly societies. Um, it used to be a lot of smaller publishers. There are still a lot of small society publishers. Um, they've modernized. Um, usually they don't have a ton of journals in their portfolio. They might have like five, 10, something like that. Um, but most of them have consolidated into these very five big major publishers sort of looming over everybody else that we see all the time. Because a lot of the journals we read are published by these companies. So it's Elsevier, Wiley, uh, Springer Nature, Taylor and Francis, and Sage. Um, so, I mean, articles used to be in print. And they'd be in bound volumes, which would be purchased by libraries and be sent to libraries. Again, since the internet, they've adapted to digital. Um, I'm sure you could imagine it's probably a lot more expensive to produce physical volumes of articles and send them places than it is to uh, have pay for a server to host something online, even if it does get a lot of traffic. Um, so the cost of publishing, like from the standpoint of the researcher or the institution, haven't really decreased, even though we don't really need print materials anymore. There aren't that many journals that a lot of them just don't do print at all. Um, we've had a lot that have started since after the internet, and those never had a print edition. Um, I mean, journals do still cost money to run. You've got to pay your employees, again, server costs, pay editors, things like that. Well, like, yeah, people who manage the journals for them, um, not the volunteer editors. Um, they they do still cost money, but they don't cost that much. Um, so it's estimated that it's like under 10% than what they actually charge in APCs. So you might wonder where the rest of the money goes. I'm also wondering that um, oftentimes to shareholders um, or CEOs, um, but also some um, born OA or born digital away publishers. These would be publishers that cropped up sort of after the internet. They never had 
subscription access versions, they've also adopted this model of um, charging APCs to fund their uh, their journals. So where open access came from, just because it's helpful to understand like what the, the original idea behind it was, um, there's these three sort of documents that were drafted and adopted, and these are kind of seen as like where it all came from. So that's the Budapest Open Access Initiative in 2002, and then the Bethesda Statement and Berlin Declarations in 2003. Um, and there's a quote up here from the Berlin Declaration, which I'm not going to read, but basically it's just saying like, hey, the internet makes everything easier. We don't have to pay all this money to um, share scientific information anymore. We can just share with everybody. Everyone should have access to it, which is a nice idea. It's kind of the idea behind this. Um, so, of course, this was initially opposed by major publishers. Um, there's one article I've read that I find amusing, so I put a quote on it from here. Basically, they um, some of them hired this like public relations guy who it, what, it was trying to help them like combat public acceptance of open access. Um, so they're saying things like, oh, this is going to be like government censorship um, and scientific journals preserve the quality and pedigree of science, which uh, is also not they were trying to get rid of them. And they still exist today. We still have scientific journals, even with open access. So it was all about like messaging. Um, but then the publishers sort of flipped on the issue. They realized like, oh, there's, there's other ways we can make money off of this. We just have to change our model. So um now they're they're all for it most of them have a big shiny like here's how we're supporting oa on their homepage. um so if you go to like elsevier or wiley's site they'll say that um and there are a lot of for-profit publishers that arose after this so these again were never a print or subscription base these are things like frontiers um mdpi those are those are the big ones um and also when people talk about open access they use this sort of like color-based taxonomy. So it's like gold, green, bronze. It's not descriptive, so I don't love it, but it's the language that everyone uses. Um, and I'll be using it in this. So I'm mostly going to be talking about gold hybrid, green, and then a bit about diamond. Gold is the um, APC-based charge. So that is what we're going to spend most of today talking about. Um, so it's open access, free for everybody to read, but the author has to pay. Hybrid is not a, a specific article can be hybrid, but a journal can be hybrid. So what that means is some articles are subscription access. So there are institutions that are paying for this journal to have read access to these paywalled articles. But some of the other articles are open access. So for those articles, the journal is collecting APCs from the authors. So they're basically getting two funding streams. Um I think a lot of people see through this and aren't big fans of hybrid, but that is how a lot of the major publishers have set many of their journals up. Um, Green OA is basically self-archiving. So um, there's institutional repositories. We have scholar works at Towson, but um, even like larger repositories and preprint repositories, um, things like archive, um, which I will look at a bit later, um, like subject specific repositories, that type of thing. Those are all versions of self-archiving um, that would fall under green OA. Bronze OA is something that's openly available online, um, like all of these other ones, but it usually doesn't have like some kind of creative commons or other open license attached to it. So like the reuse stipulations aren't super clear. Um, and it's also not, um, most of the time it's not, they don't have like a specific preservation policy. So a lot of journals, um, like commercial journals, but also um, like university presses will do this or like like library-based publishing will typically do this too, is they'll subscribe to like some um, persistent archiving service that basically keeps a version of it if something happens to the website so it doesn't go away forever because if you publish something you want basically a guarantee that you're going to be able to sort of go back to it and that it'll stay up um, forever but um, bronze doesn't have it's not clear so it could basically just disappear at any time um, so I don't we usually like to include it under OA but it's like a thing we'll, we'll hear a lot and then diamond open access is typically like scholar or institution 
organized publishing program. They tend to be a lot smaller because they don't charge a subscription, but they also do not charge um, article processing charges to authors. So they have other ways of funding. They might be through a grant. They might be crowdsourced. Um, an institution might just put up money to do that. Um, we'll talk a bit about that shortly. Um, so kind of to summarize, looking at subscription access versus gold open access, because that's what we're mostly going to be talking about. Um, and subscription access readers pay and gold OA authors pay. In both cases, authors aren't paid for their work, which I'm sure we all know very well. Um, they're both peer reviewed, assuming it's a peer reviewed journal. Of course, there's low quality journals in gold OA and also in subscription access. Um, reviewers aren't paid for their work either way. Um, so if you're getting subscription access, hopefully your library subscribes so you can read your own article. I've seen a few cases where, well, a lot of cases where um, the library doesn't subscribe to the journal that the researcher publishes in and they want to read it and it's they can't even see it up there. They have to get it through their library loan, um, which is no fun. Um, and then uh, gold open access, is for, even if you don't personally pay, you still are responsible for coordinating payment. So um, there might be some sort of like fund we don't have one here but some institutions have a fund i think overall they're realizing that it's not particularly sustainable um to have a fund that researchers can dip out of because it's not always like the way it's distributed it's very hard to make it equitable and typically um as soon as they release the funds i've heard people i know at other institutions who have them say they're gone in like six weeks for the rest of the year which isn't really helpful um, so there's got to be some other ways to do it. So again, if you don't personally pay, you're responsible for coordinating payment, whether that's through some kind of fund or through a grant. Um, with like read and publish agreements, which we'll talk about shortly, um, it's a little bit easier. But in both cases, it does privileges privilege those at wealthier wealthier institutions in wealthier countries because either they are at an institution that's able to pay for subscription access or able to find a way to pay the gold open access fees or get them paid for uh get them paid for you so that's one of the ideas behind open access originally was to sort of level the playing field give access to everyone even if they're not affiliated with a institution in a wealthier country and this really hasn't solved that problem um so a few takeaways from this gold and hybrid open access journals do let major publishers maintain their profit margins which are pretty high um so sort of just like publishers adapt to digital they are adapting to oa again they're they're profiting from it they found a way to make it profitable um some critics of apcs say they incentivize journals publishing more articles regardless of quality to make more money which it there is an incentive for that because that means they're going to get more money they're definitely paper mills were a problem before they're still a problem they're just like a, a different problem um and but there's, you know, fraud all over the place. It's kind of its own crisis that I won't I won't get too into here. Um, but some other critics of APCs that they uphold, um, like already present inequities. So if you're at a, if you're at like a subscription disadvantage before, you're not a publishing disadvantage, even though you're able to read the published work. Um, so after my little downer slides you might be wondering why publish away at all uh, we kind of can go back to the original mission i mean again you it is good to share information with um everybody who has it or, or who should be able to access it there's also an open access citation advantage um there was a systematic review um done on citation in 2021 there have been a lot of studies done on whether or not there's an actual citation advantage now there's the systematic review that covers it um almost half said yes there is one um a bit over a quarter said that there wasn't one, and then another quarter was basically saying certain disciplines have an advantage and other ones don't. So subsets of their data found it, other ones didn't. So overall, there is some advantage to it, because if more people can read your work, more people are going to cite and share. Um, the other reason you might want to publish open access is because you have a funder mandate. So in August 2022, um, the Office of Science and Technology Policy out of the White House released this public access memo. It's often called the Nelson Memo. Some people just call it the, the OSTP memo. Um, and basically what it's saying by the end of, I think, 2025, we need there needs to be, if it's federally funded research, there has to be free and immediate, which is no embargo. So it needs to be, as soon as it's published, accessible to everybody who wants to read it. Um 
a lot of the time publishers will um say hey you can like self archive a version of this but only after a year or only after 18 months like we get the first we get exclusive rights to share this for like the first year or however long um i'll show you how to look up what where those policies are also um this applies to both publications and data and a, while a lot of it is for stem because a lot of them are like stem research areas it's not just for stem so you've got like in um National Endowments for the Arts grants, that would also apply to you. Um, now you might be wondering, like, do I have a funder mandate for your uh, grant that you got for your research? So there is a way to look at it. There's this website called Sherpa Juliet. Um, I will have it open here. So um, what this is, is this is put out by this um, group that's like based in the UK so a lot of this is going to be like European centric but I find this to be a very helpful like suite of tools they have so what we're looking at now is Sherpa Juliet which is going to let you um, look up like what the conditions a funder might have for open access publication um, so if you go to the search tab they have a few other things but I'll go over those at the end under name Let's do NASA because it's fun to look up NASA. So not everything's on here. A lot of these are going to be like based in the UK um, and based in Europe because they've been doing this a bit longer and they've had the rules in place a bit longer. Um, so a lot more of those funders are going to require this, but it'll take you to the page about the funder, take you to the website, give you all this information, and then it'll say, do they require open access archiving? What you have to archive. So they want you to do the peer-reviewed publication. Um, in this case, they're saying you can do the publisher's version, but the author's final version, which is going to be basically your peer-reviewed edited text, but that doesn't include like the publisher formatting. Um, so we'll be talking about a lot of different versions of things. There's the publisher's version, which is like the final version that they put out that's formatted in with their branding and things like that. Um, the author's final version is going to be that text without the formatting. And then there's the um, like author's accepted manuscript, which is going to be like what you turned in, but that hasn't gone through the review yet. So sometimes you'll be allowed to share things like that. It's preferable to share the text of the peer reviewed version. Um, in this case, they're saying you can archive it when it's been accepted. Permitted embargo is 12 months. So while that memo said like immediate access, currently they are not doing that. They're saying there's like 12 months, like where you can put it. So in this case, Hub Space, which must be the NASA. Um, oh, this looks very, uh, love when academic websites look like they're made in Web 1.0. Um, so they've got... Yeah, they're saying that they require it. They don't, it's, yeah, it says they don't have a policy. I guess that's saying that you have to share it, but not necessarily that you have to publish an open access journal, which are, are different things. Um, they talk about, yeah, if you've got data, you've got a separate one for that. Try looking up. Yes, it does. It does look very web 1.0. Um, thankfully, there's no like clip art or a, a flashing text. Um, I'm going to find another one. So I'll show you a British one because they're a lot more like comprehensive. Um, so welcome trust. I know it's a big one there. So this one's from the United Kingdom. A lot of these are going to be part of Plan S and that's why they have to do this. So in this case, you're like, you have to archive your peer reviewed publication or any publication. They're saying it doesn't matter what version you do, where you can put it. So a lot of the times these are going to be in like PubMed Central. Typically that's going to be like what they're telling you. Sometimes they'll tell you if you have to do a um, specific archiving license. So in this case, they always want you to do a Creative Commons attribution license, which basically means you can reuse any of that. Um, they just have to give you credit. Um, what's interesting that's been brought up about like open licensing is a lot of people are concerned about um, the stuff being ingested in AI, um, like large learning language models. Um, May I guess, like, but the thing is, like, if anything, if AI can get anything, I'm pretty sure they're just like scraping all of that. Um, I don't like fully know where they're getting all of their data from. Um, 
and all of their training data. Um, I currently, as far as I know, there's not any like legal recourse if they take your stuff. Um, so I'm not sure that like choosing a Creative Commons license or not choosing a Creative Commons license is going to affect that very much. Um, but again, watch this space because I'm sure a lot of things about that will be changing um, in the near future. So um, speaking of changing, they're like updating their site. So they're consolidating all of their different services. Um, it's still in beta. It's fine. I kind of like the old versions better. Um, but they do tell you like what there used to be. You can use like general Sherpa services. So um, Sherpa Romeo, what that is, is that allows you to look up specific journals and see what their requirements are. So now I guess you just search anything in here. So um, and also Sherpa Juliet, which again was this funder mandate. Sherpa Fact, which I think lets you look up like open, yeah, open access compliers. It's like a checker tool. I haven't used that very much. Um, and then there's Open Door which is like D-O-A-R, which is looking for um, the repositories. So that's kind of helpful too. And you can also just not search all of these. You can like look for just repositories or well, let's see, well, like an economics one. Um, so it's going to give you all of these. A lot of them are going to be in the uh, like based at institutions. Um, so there's this, yeah, New Zealand research papers in economics. Um, curious what this is okay so yeah repack so this is a very big uh preprint server for um economic research papers um typically if they're dspace they're going to be an institutional repository yeah so this one's at this um institute in india they're saying like what you're allowed to put there oftentimes you are only allowed to archive things there if you're affiliated with the institution um but it'll depend there's also some more general ones um, you can also look up a journal. So, um, trying to remember what the name of this is. Environmental science and policy. Okay, so if you find the name of a journal in here, and this is what Sherpa Romeo was, um. They've got information about the publisher, um, where, where the journal comes from. They'll give you like their policies and they're saying like, okay, these are all the things you can do with the different versions. So typically it'll say like, you are allowed to share your published version open access, but you have to pay the fee, the APC, because you're publishing with them. In this case, they'll tell you how long the embargo is. There's none. Um, and that you have to use one of these licenses. Um, they're giving another version with no embargo and basically just saying you can use this other license. Um, this one, sometimes they'll say they have prerequisites. Um, and basically what that means is, if you expand it, it'll tell you that it has to, if it comes from one of these funders, um, then you, a lot of them are going to be like charities and a lot of them are European based, but the Gates Foundation's in here. Um, and this, in case it does have an open access fee associated with, I'm sure this list is going to change once like all of the Nelson memo kind of kicks in. Um, then these other ones are about the accepted version. So this isn't the final published version. This is what you've submitted for publication. And typically you can share these wherever you'd like. But in this case, they're saying, if you want to put it in your institutional repository, you need to wait two years and then put it under here. And typically they're going to say you have to like link to the final version once that version is published. Um, Oh, yeah. So the accepted version is the reviewed version. The submitted version is what you originally submitted. And that you can pretty much do whatever you want with. Um, but usually it means there's sort of a less like polished version of the article you've written floating around. So you can share that kind of pre-publication if you'd like, depending on what discipline you're in. Some disciplines have a culture of like sharing their preprints and then other researchers will like mark them up or make notes on them. Um, but that's that's not true for every discipline. So... I'll we'll continue. Okay, so you might be wondering if you have to pay an APC. We did kind of talk about that um, before. There are some ways around it. So um, you can write your funding into a grant, um, but you would have had to do that when you applied for the grant. That doesn't really help you if you've already conducted the research. Oh, yeah, I'll put in the chat right now. Um, if it doesn't really help if you've, and I'll also send all of these links out like as an email once the recording is done um, for all of the people who were not able to make it also. Yes, yeah, so if you want to like look around there, you are welcome to do that. 
Um, so yes, you um, might be, you would have had to do that writing in the grant. You might be eligible for a fee waiver via read and publish agreement. I'll go over those in a bit because we have a few. Um, again, you might be able to self-archive to fulfill the funder mandate. You just kind of have to look it up. Or I'm always happy to look it up for you because this stuff's very interesting to me. So if you're ever like too busy and you're like, hey, help me find a journal or hey, like what is my funder going to make me do in this particular case? I'm happy to look it up. Um, you also might be able to self-archive, you know, to fulfill the mandate just because you feel like it. And then not every journal charges to publish. We talked a bit about Diamond OA at the beginning. I think that's a thing that's going to grow kind of slowly, but it will grow. Um, so some of the green open access or self-archiving option. Um, so you can publish any of their stuff in ScholarWorks at Towson. Um, you just have to like email them. And the other way you can do it is if you want me to just like put it up for you, you can email me um, your that version of it um, and I'll, I'll get it to the person who is in charge of managing the repository. Um, you can also deposit it into any of your co-researchers repositories and, and all of them. So if you've got um, other people who work on a paper with you and they're at two other places, you can usually put it in all of them. Um, Preprint servers like we looked at and then we sort of briefly talked about open door for finding other repositories. Um, and there are also read and publish agreements, which um, we have a handful of them. So they are usually called transformative agreements. I don't really like that term, and a lot of people have criticized it because they're not really transforming anything. Um, some others will call it transitional agreements because they're seeing it as like a transition between these subscription access of the past and like the fully open access of the future. But I like read and publish because it says what it does. Um, so basically when we had a read agreement, we'd pay because typically it's the library, but it's an institution that's paying for subscription access to these journals. It's no longer just a read in theory. You're also paying. So your affiliated researchers can publish and then you get read access thrown in. Um, so sometimes this is in the form of a waiver. So you just don't have to pay a fee at all. Sometimes there's a discount. Obviously, we prefer a waiver to a discount. Um, in theory, it should be cost neutral. It doesn't always work out that way. But um, if you like typically, typically if you're like in a big consortium or if you're, yeah, usually it's a consortium or like a really big university system, you can sort of negotiate these things a bit better. So we're part of a handful of read and publish um, and then one direct to open, which is set up a little differently. So I will talk about what that is. Um, I will share these links, but I opened the tabs already. Um, there also is a page that will have all of these, but it's currently under construction, but I'll be able to send it out when I send out the slides. Um, so that'd be Cambridge OA, which is the first one we have, um, ACM Open Company of Biologists, Springer Nature, which I think just got the contract finalized. That's helpful. And then MIT Direct Open. So, um, so basically what, how this works is if you can like double check on the website, see what types of articles um, are accepted. Typically it's gonna be like research articles, review articles, and then sometimes there's like a handful more. Usually it's not gonna count for other article types. Like I don't know, assume if you're like writing a letter to the editor, it's probably not covered, um, but I don't think you have to worry about that anyway. Um, so Cambridge, um, University Press, that's one that we have. So if you go to this page, which I will share this and then send the other links out, but it's sort of helpful to play around with it. What annoys me is that I can't just link directly to um, the page. You have to like go here and type it in every time. Um, so we're in the US, because they have these places all over the world. Um, it's thinking very hard. Hotel, so. So pick the institution and it'll take you to a publishing agreement. So in this case, it'll say um, the charge discount is full, which is great. Um, you can publish no cost, um, publish OA at no cost in journals covered by this agreement. It's not every single one of their journals, but it's almost all of them. Um, they do have a list here alphabetically, but you can also filter by subject. Uh, it's psychiatry. So these are all the ones that you're able to publish in. They have pretty easily big portfolio and what i like about these is that um whether it's a fully open access journal or a hybrid journal they they qual both of them qualify which is helpful um, which is nice because every 
not every single publisher is going to let you do that in a fully open access journal. Sometimes they just let you do it in hybrid journals. Um, then they tell you what your next steps are. So basically, if you want to find one of these you want to submit to, um, you need to make sure you're using your institutional affiliation and that you are the corresponding author um, in order to take advantage of this. Um, because it's based on whoever submits it, but it's going to apply to everybody that's all of your co-authors. Um, so once it's been accepted, you just say, hey, I want to do gold open access, pick a Creative Commons license. If you ever need help doing that, I'm happy to talk you through it. But um, that's that's like a whole other <laughs> um, presentation, so I won't do that. Um, and then, yeah, they're saying check any funder mandates. Maybe if you have specific license that you need to use, then they have more information here. Um, basically, all you have to do is like use your Towson email and then they send it to us and just say, hey, is that person really affiliated? And we say, yeah. And then that's it. And then it gets published. And you don't have to pay, which is nice. Um, we have very similar agree agreements with a few others. Um, not all these are direct. Some of them we get through Lyricist, which is like a big sort of library consortium we apply, uh, belong to. But it's helpful because they're able to negotiate like these deals with um, because there it's so many libraries that are involved. So um, we also have one with um, the Association for Computing Machinery. So they're they're smaller, so they don't have as many journals as Cambridge OA, but there are still a bit. This is going to also cover, this is a very long and complicated way of saying that they're going to cover the APCs. Um, tier pricing, that's basically just for like people who are, are paying the, uh, the subscription for it. Um, so there's more information about that here. Company of Biologists, this is one we have directly um, through them. So they're a society publisher, so they're a lot smaller. So they have um, just like five journals as part of this. So that's the package we subscribe to. So it's their three hybrid journals. So it's Development, Journal of Cell Science, Journal of Experimental Biology, plus the fully open access journals, which are Disease Models and Mechanisms and Biology Open. So you can um, submit your article to any of these. And if you're accepted, you won't have to pay an APC. It is the same... Um, if you like go to our list, it'll give you more information about us. So these are the consortium agreements, and they have these ones with the individual institution. We are listed under the gotta scroll down. Okay, we're listed under the five journal package. Same setup as the Cambridge one. You just submit, you're making sure you're the corresponding author, you're using your institutional email. There was one one of these pages says something about like submitting the article like while you're on your institution's network, which I I didn't think about before and I don't know if it like really has that much of an effect on it but they mentioned it so maybe it matters maybe it just makes it easier for them to like it's like fewer checks they have to do but um I thought that was interesting I guess it can't hurt to do that um so but again yeah just get sent to us we say yeah that person works here and then that's it um the the exciting one because it's a much much big publisher um, is Springer Nature. So this is not going to cover everything they have. I think it's not even, I don't even know if it's all of the nature things. Yeah. So it's, it might not be all the nature branded journals. There's a lot of like specific things here. Um, so basically you're part of Lyricis and they, they've been trying to negotiate this for a while. And I think it like just got finalized. So I haven't like a few weeks ago, I haven't learned very much about it yet, but or about the details. So this is through the end of December 2027. I'll share this in case anyone is interested because I know a lot of people publish with them. Um, they've got their list of eligible journals. I know this is going to be like a very large Excel file, so I'm not going to now, but they have um, like the author guide. So they'll tell you like what types of articles are eligible. Um, oh, okay. This is like a you know what? I'm just going to look at that later. So there's a small, a smaller thing down here that just is like a basic um, frequently asked questions. Like, how do I make sure this is eligible? Yeah, they're the ones who said do the form while you're on your institution, institution's network. It's very interesting. Um, like what article types are covered? So typically they're going to be like these, but most of the time we're seeing like original paper and review paper. Um, how you contact them for more information. What if you're not covered? Again, you can just like find other ways to fund it. Um, but the one important thing to know about this is that it's open access in a hybrid journal. So I guess they weren't able to negotiate anything for like a fully open access journals. Yeah, and it doesn't include the things in the nature portfolio. So it's anything under the Springer name and then these two other brands that they, they publish under. Um, but 
It's more than we had before, so it's nice. Um, the other one I wanted to bring up, which is different, is um, MIT's Direct to Open. So Direct to Open or Subscribe to Open, are a, it's a different funding model. So basically what this is, is rather than charging APCs, um, you get, a, they look for a certain number of institutions to subscribe to it, and then they make it open for everybody as long as they hit their number. Um, so there's a few that are set up this way. We're, we're in this one. So basically, um, when you keep paying your participation fees, you get lists to like all of their new front list items, but you also get their backlist titles, um, which would otherwise be gated, which is nice. And it will cover part of the cost because a lot of these will still, especially with monographs, they still print them and that does cost a bit more money than just having it online. Um, so this is another one we're part of. If you want to publish a book, this might be a way to do it. And then, um, so Diamond Open Access, we did talk a bit about earlier. Um, so that doesn't charge uh, fees to readers or fees to authors. So you might be wondering like how they fund it. Um, typically an institution will fund it. Or, or they could be funded by grants. Some of them are crowdsourced. So because of this, usually they are quite a bit smaller. Um, a lot of the journals are going to be newer because it's typically a newer thing. Um, it is a growing model. So um, researchers in Latin America are global leaders in this. They have like a way more sophisticated setup for diamond open access than like anybody else in the world. Um, because while everyone in the world's been shifting towards OA slowly but surely, um, they don't all do it the same way. So in North America and in um, Europe, they've definitely been favoring the um, gold open access, which is the APC based model, which makes sense because a lot of the large publishers are based in Europe. Um, but in Latin America, they've been just doing things a bit differently. So typically they're going to have like a sort of scholar led um, diamond open access situation the only problem with that is that because of this and because a lot of them are newer they're not as well indexed in scopus or web of science so that's sort of a downside of that hopefully it changes um then so i've got a link to the directory of open access journals so this is helpful if you want to find like other places to publish you want to find information about other journals so this is um like a global group and they have um it, it is volunteers who run it, um, but they, they index things like basically only after they've been vetted um, and then they'll like, you know, go through and make sure everything still is OK. Um, so, yeah, you don't have to give them money to be part of this, um, but it's an index of open access journals. I think we'll have. Oh, they turned 20 years old last year. That's nice. Um, so the guide to applying, I think, is helpful because they're going to talk about the like criteria for inclusion. So that's saying like they need to basically do all of these things. They need to do at least five articles. So again, that doesn't sound like a lot. A lot of these are pretty small operations. Um, they only accept open access journals. This in this case, it's with an open license. So basically, they're saying they want to give usage rights to the readers. Um, they don't say that you have to, um, give the authors, like help the authors retain their copyright on their article. Um, but I think they suggest that you do that. Um, so basically yeah, you have to have an open access statement, no embargo period. You, you're allowed to charge for the print version, but you can't charge for the online version. Um, so they have all of these here. There is also the DOAJ seal, which, um, they have like a special distinction and that they hit all of these other, um, requirements they have like a good like persistent archiving policy um so let's see if there's an example of that um I'm just gonna look at yeah education policy i must have searched that at one point so because it's global not all of them are going to be in english um a lot of the time they accept link or articles in english so this one's turkish this one only so accepts in portuguese um see so yeah, a lot of these might be in south america because uh they have more of these um but you can filter by language so let's see look at an english one um nonpartisan education review okay so if you click on the name of the journal it'll link you to their website and it'll give you all of these 
sort of fast facts about it. So in this case, there's no publication fees to publish in this journal. Typically, they're going to link to these things, and usually it's going to be like the aim and scope, editorial board, um, what the peer review policy is. And then this is like, do you retain your copyright um, and your publishing rights? Usually if there's a um, and the link to the open access statement, whether they have a specific Creative Commons license they're going to have you use or not. And then who the publisher is. In this case, it's this group. Um, so... That's one of them. Another thing, and I'll show you one with the directory of open access journal, uh, journals seal. So some of them get this DOAJ seal. Um, so here's a Canadian publication. Oh, this one charges APCs. Um, so some of them do, but you can find ones that don't. So in that case, they charge like almost 2000. Let's do, you can filter it to without fees. So there's fewer of them. Um, yeah, so here's one about of a publisher in the United Kingdom, the International Journal of Development, Education, and Global Learning. So in this case, there's no publication fees, but it would tell you if there were. When it began publishing open access, um, so it, they've got their digital archive. They use Portico, which is basically they've got um, a deposit there. They have a deposit policy with Sherpa Romeo. So they're going to, or Sherpa Romeo, I keep calling it Romeo. They're going to show up there. The persis or the permanent article identifiers that they assign DOIs, which that's another good thing. Um, but basically they've sort of fulfilled these extra requirements in order to get the seal. So um, you can, you can be indexed in the DOAJ without meeting the seal criteria, but um, they're, there's some others. So like you got to have a digital preservation policy. They have to do a lot of self-archiving. You have to use a DOI. Um, you have to deposit the metadata. You talk about licensing. Um, yeah, so that's that's their seal criteria. I think they have been talking about maybe switching to like different distinctions um, because just the way these are set up, they it's a lot easier for established publishers to get the seal. Um, but if that's what you're looking for specifically, um, then it's sort of helpful in filtering out the other ones you might not want to publish in. Because um, if you like have specific requirements about this needs to be, depending on what discipline you're from, it needs to be like a high impact journal. Typically publishing in a very new journal isn't going to be as, as well, isn't going to be, as um accepted so oh i suppose that was the end of it so um thank you for coming i'll put my email in the here are my references i'll put the email in the chat and then i will stop recording in case you have questions that are you don't want to have recorded um